you very much for coming today. It is my great pleasure to see all of you in our first seminar that we have launched in, launched in uh, the Frames of Nordic Ukraine Forum. Uh, it is called uh, Ukraine Focus, and our intention is to organize each second uh, Friday of the month discussion which will be related to Ukraine, because we think that um, audience needs um, expertise and we need to have the platform where we can discuss different issues and uh, dig deeper. So today we will have the first uh, panel of this kind and I'm very glad that our specialists in the field of disinformation, media studies um, have accepted this invitation. Uh, moreover, I'm very glad that uh, Lisa will be the moderator. Lisa is very much involved in the topics of Ukraine at the moment. She has been herself to Ukraine recently and is writing a book. So maybe you will tell a little bit more on your experience, but I think it is really a unique opportunity uh, to bring all these wonderful people together. Um, my name is Alina Zubkovich. I'm the director of Nordic Ukraine Forum. And for those uh, who might not yet heard about us, uh, we, are, we have different types of specialization at the moment related to Ukraine, meaning that we also have some humanitarian projects to help uh, Ukrainians in Sweden. But we um, try to, uh, to build bridges between Sweden and Ukraine and bring some advocacy and certain expertise. So, Please uh, feel free to check our website to learn more on the projects that we have and also uh, please uh, subscribe to our newsletter. We try to bring all uh, events that are happening related to Ukraine and Sweden on a weekly basis. And um, I hope you will enjoy this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you so many people have come here on a Friday, so we're very happy. We were just saying maybe everyone will be um, out to dinner or going to the cinema, but instead you came here. So thank you very much for that. Just briefly about um, tonight, we will be having the panel discussion until about 6 p.m. And then we've said we're going to leave about 20 to 30 minutes for audience questions uh, and a discussion. So if you want to say anything, you have to uh, bite your tongue and wait or write it up and uh, save those thoughts for later. But uh, without further ado, I think we should use this uh, hour as efficiently as possible because uh, this topic of disinformation and how to win the information war in Ukraine is so fascinating. It has so many different layers to it. I will do brief uh, introductions of you all, because all of you three have very lengthy CVs. They have about three pages each. <laughs> so we're just going to do very short. And if you want to, you can mention your work during the discussion, I think. So from left to right, we have Joram Bulin. You are a professor in Media and Communication Studies at Södertörn University. Welcome. Thank you. And here in the middle, we have Katerina Boyko. You are a journalist and a media expert. And right now, you have uh, joined the dark arts, I was going to say, by entering the academic world instead. So you're a PhD student at Uppsala University. Welcome. And then, not least, uh, we have Roman. And I'm thinking, how do I pronounce your surname? Is it just Horbuk? That's quite good. Horbuk. Horbuk. Yeah. Okay, excellent. You are a senior <laughs> lecturer at Örebro University. Uh, and you have also done lots of different theses on everything from the Weimar Republic, Soviet Ukraine, uh, media power in representations of Europe in Ukraine, uh, and so on. So I think we're going to divide this discussion into three parts just to make it a little bit more structured here. So first we're going to talk about what Ukraine is doing right. Because it actually seems, uh, and this is just not an opinion from us up here, it's actually more or less uh, an international consensus on this issue, 
that Ukraine is leading, if not winning, the information war right now. Um, why? What is it doing right? What's going on in established media as well as social media? Then we'll move on to what Russia is not doing right. Uh, they used to be uh, quite feared for their disinformation campaigns, propaganda, psyops, uh, and so on. Uh, how could uh, such a, a small nation as Ukraine, who hasn't been regarded as experts in this field, overtake them in the information battle? And last but not least, we're going to discuss what Sweden can learn from all of this. Uh, because, as you know, we are not sheltered at all from Russian troll factories, as they are called. Uh, Russian disinformation and propaganda is thought to be on the increase. Uh, we are especially vulnerable, of course, during this application process uh, to NATO that we are in uh, at the moment. So let's start with what uh, Ukraine is doing right. What is going on? What are they doing? They've successfully been nation building online. What is that? Can some of you explain, please? And we have one microphone for you. So unfair. I can just hog this one all night. <laughs> but you have to divide this uh, brotherly and sisterly. You want to start? Well, I thought maybe yeah, okay. Uh, so, yes, uh, it's. Um, uh, first, I want to say something about the concept of information war, because I think increasingly uh, behind this question, why is Ukraine reaching out so successfully, I think we also need to think that information war is not, is, uh, is, is not uh, divided from the war on the ground, so to speak. It's an integrated process, the, the information and the battle on, on, on the ground. Uh, so, 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 so this, and this is why I think Ukraine has been successful, because they combine these things. Uh, also shortly, I think, in order to understand the, the way why uh, Ukraine is, is successful towards the West, I should say. I don't. I think we, we should acknowledge that there are other parts in the world where they don't reach out as well. <laughs> uh, you have to go back to the Euromaidan revolution in 2013 and 14, when when uh, you could see, uh, uh, or I could see, because I was doing research on in that time, how PR business, uh, governmental agencies, and NGOs, civil society organizations, were teaming up. Uh, and forming sort of network structure communication uh, for uh, Ukraine crisis media center, for example, to also stop fake and, and uh, journalistic uh, from, uh, journalistic initiatives. And these networks have persisted. And what we can see now is this: the, the combination of very sort of skilled PR technologies people that does the, the videos that uh, Zelensky is, is showing when he does speeches in, in parliaments and at block festivals and all over, highly skilled uh, people behind those images. And, and this is why I think it, it speaks to, to us uh, in the West. I love you getting applause from the other room. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> They're having an art exhibition here. Yeah. So I have to ask you, because you mentioned something very interesting here, of course, that this is, there's an entire industry behind this. Uh, there is an IT industry. There are, there are experts working on this. Where do all these people come from? I know many Ukrainians have been working in Silicon Valley, for example, yeah. uh, owning their skills. So was Ukraine a very strong IT nation to start with? Is that where they've been drawing the manpower? Yes, it, it was. Uh, I mean, Ukraine is, uh, I mean, the level of education is, of course, quite high, and also in technology and IT technology. So, so that's one part of it. But of course, also other PR people are trained at British and US universities uh, uh, in, in public relations and, and uh, sort of nation branding practice and, and those types of, of, uh, of areas of communication. And let's bring up some specific examples, um, and please do analyze them from your expert perspective. Um, like Alina mentioned, I just recently got back from Ukraine, and there are so many. Um, 
amazing slogans on t-shirts, on cups and everything, and they are really uh, resonating here. You can see the same uh, slogans on t-shirts at Norman Story demonstrations as you can in a Lviv suburb, for example. A Be Like Ukraine is one of them. Who comes up with it? Are some of them going back to the Maidan revolution? Or, or, and how do they, do they try them out to know that they do not have the adverse effect uh, on the war as a whole and on the general public? Well, that's also the, the part of PR. I mean, when you do a PR campaign, you, you, you try out your slogans and your visual, uh, visuals, etc. On focus groups, uh, I, I, uh, well, my, the, the study I made was before the, the full-scale invasion, so I only know from that, but I imagine that this is what they do also. So you, you make a, a, a video or you make a campaign material and then you go out and try it on people. And then you go back home and adjust, this worked, this didn't work, so it's basically a trial and error thing. And then you go full scale for, with the things that works. And we have to mention an important aspect here. I mean, we're analyzing now what Ukraine is doing, not just for its people, but aimed towards a Western audience, right? And what we're seeing that Russia is doing, the, the infamous Z campaign that reminds most of us in this room of a, of a big swastika. It has a very a sinister feel to it. Uh, it's not aimed at us. That is aimed towards an internal, a domestic audience, right? Um, so... That is also a kind of uh, non-ex question I think many of us are thinking about. How come Russia doesn't have these um, outgoing uh, you know, campaigns aimed at the rest of the world? I think that we want to consolidate uh, uh, in, in domestically. Uh, that's what I, what, I, what I think. They are clearly not talking to us because we might laugh at these uh, images that they produced because they are clumsy and they are, have a language that doesn't speak to us, but it speaks to people in Russia. I mean, we should acknowledge that Putin and the war has support from Russian population. There is one infamous video of um, uh, what to uh, Western eyes looks like a, a huge group of thugs in an underground parking house. Uh, where they are all screaming and oh, and it's this sad yeah. thing, and it just looks like soccer hooligans. Uh, but again, it was hugely popular there, and uh, obviously perceived as a, a, a good example of nation building, of of creating a togetherness. I also think that all these cute memes and all these T-shirts and these slogans that we see here, it's not a product of. Um, monopolized uh, branding campaign made by the Ukrainian government or state. These are products of multiple bottom-up initiatives. And probably that's why it works so good, because it's from the bottom of their heart. Okay. And there, it's organic, it's what people <laughs> think and what people believe in. I think that's why it works. It's, a, it's an excellent um, comment, and it reminds, I think, many of us of the NAFO, N-A-F-O campaign that you might have seen with uh, the cute military dogs, mm. sort of cartoon dogs, uh, the North Atlantic Fellow Organization. Almost difficult to describe it more than that if you haven't seen it, uh, but it's uh, like an internet trend, and there are tens of thousands of them. So they've been scorned officially by uh, Russian politicians, which of course makes them even funnier to Ukrainian and Western eyes, uh, that Russia it puts such an effort into scorning images of laughing dogs. <laughs> um, so again, but are we, are we seeing this with too much of Western eyes then? Maybe, maybe Ukraine uh, isn't winning the information war, just to be, be um, the devil's advocate here. I would say that if we talk about war, then we understand that it's a very complicated thing and that it has a lot of fronts. And if we talk about these specific narratives that, for example, okay, Ukraine is a victim of aggression, then probably yes, Ukraine is winning in this battle or this narrative. Because we all were observing that for eight years the war that was in Ukraine was named Ukrainian crisis. 
and we Ukrainian scholars were fighting over it. Guys, it's not a crisis, it's not a civic war, it's a war of aggression towards us. And I think that moment when Ukrainian crisis stopped being, and it was named Russo-Ukrainian War, that was a very first and very important stone in this victory over the narrative that yes, we are liberating these poor Ukrainians who are almost Russians from this Nazi hunt or something like that. And yes, um, this situation became black and white. We know who is aggressor and we name this aggressor honestly. And I think it helps also to win the war, uh, to name things with their real names. And then, if we talk about uh, external communication, we have this, I would say, ambassadors of Ukrainian resistance. And first of all, these are journalists who go there to Ukraine and local Ukrainian journalists who do this heroic work and cover all these events. And I think this is what tells for itself. And then we have this icon of Ukrainian resistance who is very popular in the West, and this is President Zelensky, of course. And I think that now his militarized image it works very well. And then we have cute, um, cute, cute uh, characters. characters of resistance. For example, a dog patrol. This is mind sniffing, cute Jack Russell Terrier. And when any Western leader comes to Kyiv, they want to shake a hand, a hand, a poor yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, shaking hand. Yeah, 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 but, but they all are doing it. And then I think that Ukrainians are also so good at creating memes and collecting these heroic stories, and they're exporting them abroad as well. So we have these memes of resistance, which are popular all over the world. And I think uh, the meaning about Russian worship and where it should go is probably one of the most prominent. I don't know. I, I love that you bring up humor because of course it's, it's, there is one thing lacking from an authoritarian regime going slowly towards a full-on dictatorship. It's obviously humor. And even Charlie Chaplin knew this when he made the, the classic imitation of Hitler. Uh, and it's so true, but it's also very inspiring that despite being under a full-scale invasion, uh, Ukrainians of all ages can keep up with uh, such a high sense of creativity and a sense of humor uh, on all fronts, actually. Um, and that's all inspiring, and I, I'm not sure uh, how, it, how you do it, actually. Uh, but it's obviously working. Um, yeah, well, I would like to um, uh, speak also about um, the internal uh, roots of uh, Ukrainian resilience in terms of information war, because Ukraine, um, as, as you all rightly said, has a very um, a robust PR scene, uh, but also Ukraine has been a, a very strong uh, producer of entertainment content on TV particularly. So um, it's, uh, it might be kind of a bit unknown in the West uh, because of course it's a different kind of market that Ukraine is selling. I mean a lot of, for example, TV series were sold to uh, Turkey or Poland. Uh, Russia for a while was uh, pretty kind of mad about Ukrainian entertaining shows from uh, television. So Ukraine has very um, a strong and professional storytellers, actually, like screenwriters, and, you know, and, uh, people who uh, can create stories. And I think I would argue that Ukraine is winning, or we could say Ukraine has won the first stage of information war in the West because Russia is still doing very strong internally, and Russia is doing great in Africa, and in, in, the, near, in, in the Middle East and in Asia, you would say. Latin America as well, right? So, but in the West, yes, we can say Ukraine has won, thanks to um, basically telling a, a better story. And um, there are um, several elements here. So the, the, the first element is, of course, the strong infrastructure here, right? And the, the, the presence of this experience. Uh, then um, there is such an um, aspect as an um, innovative use of different storytelling techniques. I would argue actually that Ukraine is using quite a lot of transmedia storytelling to kind of integrate all of possible media 
and even um, non-media events, such as the sinking of the Moskva uh, cruiser, to weave a really fine storyline around this. So if, if I can take up this example with the Russian warship, yeah, go to that, right? Uh, we will see how it took off simply as a meme, as a catchy phrase. And then it kind of developed, morphed into new types of content, such as posters and billboards in Ukraine, signposts at the protest um, in, in the West. And then we saw the uh, uh, post stamp uh, issue, which is, of course, a tool of nation branding. They would use, they would, that was used used really um, in, a, in, a, in, in a fascinating way to kind of um, enhance this story. And then the day after it was released, the cruiser was sank. And I'm wondering, this timing, was it incidental? Was it driven purely by the military logic? Or perhaps was it driven by storytelling logic? I would bet my bottom dollar on the latter. Option, right? And then there is an, an aspect of um, you know this networked uh, bottom-up action and mobilization of the society. Something also that um, uh, Katarina mentioned and that you mentioned is an NAFO example. You know, it, it's uh, fascinating, and there are many more examples um, like that from Ukraine. So I could, for example, bring up an example of terror on the fans which is an initiative to raise funds for the Ukrainian army, where um, people, um, you know, m many of them uh, were already um, kind of selling uh, erotic content on OnlyFans, which is the platform to do that. And now they're doing this to raise funds for the Ukrainian army, you know. Uh, so um, basically, uh, the, the, this power of uh, network, is um, really strong and innovative, and of course, at this stage, it is beating this centralized and hierarchical kind of information management that Russia is uh, portraying. And I have to just add, as a journalist, it's also so interesting to see how Ukraine understands our current media climate, that we're always hungry for content. It's so fast, today's media content. I mean, it's just 24-7, news, news, news. Uh, we need images, we need video clips. Uh, it's just becoming more and more hectic by the month, especially at a big global news event, such as a, a major European war. <coughs> so for example, if you go to Lviv, to the media center, every morning there is a briefing where they say, these are the stories we have. They offer you the story, the person to interview, uh, and sometimes even uh, several photographs or video clips to choose from. Uh, and the range is also absolutely spot on. It can be one story uh, about a female sniper, for example, which they know will speak to every single female journalist in the room um, and to most Western media outlets, because we want to show uh, that this is a very diverse army, uh, as opposed to the Russian army, for example. Uh, but the, the journalistic and the ethical question will always be, you know, we don't want to become, uh, at least I don't, and most of my good colleagues don't, uh, want to become megaphones, <coughs> just uh, amplifiers for a nation, however much empathy we feel for an embattled nation, right? Uh, we just don't want to copy a message, even if it's brilliant, even if it's spot on, and even if it's good for the readers and viewers, and will add something to their knowledge. Um, what do you think about that balancing act? How, how can you do that without being, being too pushy, without making a foreign media feel like they're being served too much in their lap? Uh, yeah, I, I've also been thinking about this question because they are sometimes balancing you know, this uh, sort of, I mean, when nationalism goes too far, it could, puts away people uh, that are not part of the nation. Uh, and this is, I, 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 I'm not sure what's the secret behind it, but these campaigns, be brave like Ukraine, that they have uh, this sort of bordering on being a bit too much sometimes, I think, but they are, they are uh, there hasn't been any reaction. I think there's a lot of goodwill also on part of, of Western audiences. Uh, so I think that message might not have worked in, in more peaceful time. I think that would have been, uh, seen as too much, so to speak, but when it works in this context, and I think this is 
some type of finger spits if you need, <laughs> that, that these people that construct these uh, campaigns are working with. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the goodwill, I, I totally agree. But there's also then a bad will, I know there's not such a word, but uh, there's you know, a judgmental a preconception when it comes to Russia. So for example, there is a case of a Russian soldier who has deserted from the army and he's now written a book. Yeah. And Western media has been very critical from the start, uh, without it, it, it even being available in any language, even in English, so no one could have read it. They're saying, you know, yeah, yeah, you, this is what you're saying now, but what did you do in Ukraine? What did you uh, participate in? Uh, which has shocked me a little bit. To be honest, uh, in order to have successful information, su successful information war, we need uh, to make our listeners on Facebook to hear us. Please keep it very close. Thank you. Um, I was thinking that media coverage of war is a matter of balancing all the time, and if we talk about internal situation, it's also a matter of constant finding, looking for this balance. Because what I can say, what are, what are major challenges even about internal media coverage of the war? And I think that one of the major challenges is having this trust that people should trust to the authorities and trust what they are told. And how can we reach this trust if sometimes journalists are not allowed to be on the front line? And we have rational reasons for it. It's very dangerous for soldiers and like or soldiers, journalists, and, and soldiers have their work to do, not just um, securing safety of the journalists. So there are some reasons, but sometimes we don't know what is actually going on for military reasons and for the sake of the victory. So how to preserve this trust? It's one challenge. Another challenge is how to find this balance between people being in this euphoric mood or being in despair. Because I think that sometimes emotionally, if we look into the Ukrainian segment of social media, is this are this roller coaster <coughs> up and down, despair, happiness. We are winning, we are not winning. So I think that these are challenges, and I don't know how much they are successful in this policy. What do you think? Um, well, I think uh, they, uh, there are ups and downs, uh, certainly. So um, I guess uh, some some of the things are um, working out really well. So I could say um, I could bring up just an example from yesterday because um, you all probably know that Ukraine is um, uh, currently on a, a counteroffensive uh, near Kharkiv, which uh, has so far gone really well. And um, the, the, the government and the armed forces, uh, their communication officers, actually faced a really a serious challenge about how to cover this. You know, first not to, um, so that they wouldn't like give too much information to the foe. And then on the other hand, how not to create too much expectation among the public, the Ukrainian public, because, you know, when they, um, well, the Ukrainians, you know, are very um, emotional people, and, uh, you know, when things are going well, they tend to become a bit bombastic, you know, <laughs> about themselves. So, uh, you know, an 80 kilometer offense in uh, Kharkiv, you know, people will start uh, expecting that by the end of the month, uh, the Ukrainian army will be in Crimea, you know, which, uh, and, and then if, when it doesn't happen, you know, the people will um, become depressed and, you know, mistrusting the government and so on. So it was a really serious challenge. So um, for one example, uh, how, how they went about this, which is really, I think, really fine and something for, um, I guess, um, armed forces around the world to learn from, they actually told about the developments in the words of the Russians. So they said, literally, we all know that Russians are lying all the time, so here is what they are saying in their Telegram channels about this. And then they kind of described the 
um, a situation as really, really devastating for the Russians and the offensive as really successful, but then they were like every time, uh, at every paragraph, uh, you know, the bottom line was, but you know, that Russians might be lying. So in that case, you know, you see, right? When if the offensive didn't go well, they could uh, they would be able to say, but you know, the Russians were lying from the very beginning. We were just you know uh, re retelling what they uh, wrote in their um, uh, Telegram channels, right? And then when the um, uh, or if the um, counteroffensive is getting well, then it simply will 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 not matter, right? So it's just. Um, one example uh, um, of uh, how it can be done in a really, really interesting and smart way, you know? So the, the, these interesting communication techniques and tactics are very innovative, I guess, and they are, again, a lot um, about uh, storytelling. So I think th this is something that, um, in a way, will define probably this uh, information war as part of this war. And speaking of using the words of the enemy, what are your thoughts of uh, the very frequent use of uh, intercepted phone conversations between Russian soldiers and their wives, girlfriends and mothers that have created uh, sometimes even uh, shockwaves across the earth? We have heard uh, some of them uh, lamenting to their mothers how they have been forced to commit atrocities. And in other cases, uh, they have joked about uh, going to rape Ukrainian women. And uh, a girlfriend or wife have said, oh, you go ahead and do that. Just make sure you wear protection. And we've all been, uh, uh, you know, rightfully Shocked. horrified by this. Uh, but there are also ethical concerns, of course. I mean, how have they gotten the hold of it? Can we be 100% sure uh, that they are factual? What about the ethics of the laws of war? Are they completely unproblematic, would you say? Uh, well, if I can continue briefly, um, my opinion is that um, there are no perfect choices, right? And uh, this is a gray zone, right, ethically. But uh, we always have to wait, you know, the, the kind of balance, the consequences, right, so before we are making choice. And I think the um, knowledge of what is going on the ground is here more important than privacy concerns or things like that. Right, so it's kind of, um, I mean, uh, Russians are um, raping, uh, castrating, and um, uh, killing people indiscriminately. You know, just, um, I mean, uh, leaking their phone calls is probably a, 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 a lesser concern here. And another thing, how do we know that they are factual? Of course, uh, I mean, you cannot really realistically doctor that much content. I mean, there are hundreds, thousands of them out there. There are not enough, I mean, Ukraine is of course a country of storytellers story and actors, but there are also details such as accent, you know, or even the way they mispronounce Ukrainian uh, place names. So, for example, the Ukrainian city of Sumy becomes Sumy, or uh, the Ukrainian uh, the town of uh, Hostomel becomes Gastani. Uh -huh, so, I see, now you yeah. would know this, but what, what, yeah. would a journalist from New Jersey know this? Probably not, and, yeah. and I think that's why there is a hesitancy uh, within uh, my profession. And also the, the sheer amount that you say, if there's a thousand, even if 999 are correct, what if you publish that, that fake one, made by you know, a couple of young IT guys and girls in Ukraine who mean well, probably, but who have no idea of ethics? <laughs> I'm now you're, sorry, I'm now taking you're over. To yeah. <laughs> Just one example. I actually heard one fake uh, conversation, huh? which was uh, purportedly a conversation, a, a leaked um, and recorded conversation between Putin and Shoigu. And the voices were relatively realistic. I mean, not quite, you know, when you really listen to it, but yeah. But then, you know, there was one fine detail because uh, they used. Um, some Ukrainian place names, and um, uh, this Putin, to, <laughs> Putin pretender, let's say, um, uh, used uh, the Ukrainian form of the name for Babin Yar, so he's a Babin Yar, instead of, and, and any Russian would say Babi Yar, and Putin certainly, you know, so I could immediately tell that he was fake, and this is not what I'm seeing in, in um, uh, these soldier-leaked uh, conversations. <laughs> you probably need to be uh, working part-time then for Swedish media as a fact-checker because uh, there are actually quite a lot of Ukrainian journalists 
who are uh, doing that kind of work, but uh, not nearly enough, of course. If I may continue, uh, I think that what we should keep in mind here is that um, they are not revealing any personal information, that we don't know their names or addresses or phone numbers of these soldiers. So at least we need to invest a lot of effort in order to track them, right? So here it's a kind of pro in an ethical way. And yes, this is uh, what state relates. And I don't remember why I was supposed to say it. But if we talk about bottom-up initiatives, I can tell you a lot of different stories about ethically dubious things that are going on. And they are very interesting because they are on the edge of trespassing law. Uh, because there are a lot of communities that do not represent Stanley, obviously, and they are doing various interesting things, like uh, phoning to Russian uh, schools, metro stations, theaters, and telling that there are bombs there. Uh, calling uh, wives and uh, mothers of Russian soldiers, because there are a lot of assumed communities and they are locating and def uh, looking for these uh, soldiers that are taken part in the war. So uh, we know a lot of names and a lot of addresses. So the people are calling their wives and calling their mothers and telling that their son is dead. And this is all recorded and then people are listening to it and loving it. Well, there are such things. There is also one community, they try to scam uh, Russians and uh, this money that they got, uh, they try to go sent to Ukrainian armed forces. So if we talk about these ethically dubious things, there are some things going on. But who are these hackers? Do you know? Mm, personally, no, but I am looking at those communities online. Yes, but could you know, could you say a little bit? I mean, have they been active in, you know, anonymous and these hacker collectives before or you know, are they mainly from Kiev, Lviv, bigger cities? Are they even in Ukraine, or is it exiled Ukrainians? I think since these are online communities, it's hard to say they could be all over the place. Probably they ever met visitors. Uh, these prankers, they are very well known, and they are kind of uh, stars within some... Uh, uh, underground uh, social media stars, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pranker is known, for example. He is even uh, selling some merch with uh, his uh, avatar. But you know, some uh, even managed to hack into uh, some um, TV station on the uh, Ukrainian Independence Day and uh, play the Ukrainian national anthem over Russian uh, TV, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that must have been an embarrassment. Yes, yes. To I Russia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I think they did that on television in Crimea this, today as well, oh. to, to broadcast uh, Ukrainian speeches from Zelensky, etc. Yeah. Uh, and they've done that before also to hack the, the, the television broadcasts. Uh, but I was thinking, well, as you were speaking about this uh, sort of borderline case, the ethical dimension mm -hmm. of what you put out there on the web. I mean, we see now a lot of uh, uh, short video clips of prisoners of war, of Russian prisoners of war, and uh, that's also. I mean, you are. I mean, that can very easily backfire if they are mistreated, etc. Uh, and uh, this, I, I think, we will see more and more of these kinds of images uh, now. I mean, I can understand that they want to show how young these kids are, etc. But uh, but there is, it's it's sort of threading on a very thin line here, here uh, because when you start degrading them, that can also backfire uh, communications-wise, that the sympathy of the audience becomes uh, on the, the ones that are mistreated, I mean, on the Russian side. So. 
But, but is there also um, the same fact in this information war, would you say, that we in the media go by, which is that you can't do too much. There's a, a very crude saying that I'm not going to repeat here, but it's basically that you can't have someone who's a victim too many times because it gets too much for people. And I noticed that a tweet containing an incredibly tragic video of a young Ukrainian girl who's had her leg bombed off, so she's only got one leg left. She's learning to walk again in America, and she's singing like a song. She's singing the national anthem of Ukraine, and her hair is braided. It, it, it was always, it was like too much for people. It hadn't gotten nearly as many likes or retweets as uh, an injured soldier, an adult soldier. So my journalistic interpretation would be that thing where it's just too much. It's a girl, she's injured, she's cute, she's singing a national anthem. People are like, I can't take it, you know, it, it's just too much. Uh, but maybe that's what you, what you were saying, Roman, that um, sometimes you use so much emotional force that it almost backfires or it leaves people numb. We can't relate in Sweden. It just goes over our heads. I, I guess um, there is also an interesting aspect of uh, a victim versus um, a hero, right? So, uh, and, and it's kind of uh, complex, um, and it's, it's, it's really uh, tricky to kind of um, uh, understand what the public will want to see at any given moment, right? So I think uh, perhaps for some people, Ukraine has been actually quite annoying for putting up so much resistance, you know, for just for refusing to be a victim, you know, for, uh, pardon my French, for uh, kicking the enemy's ass, right? So uh, may maybe we are in, in this, um, I don't know, um, uh, I don't know, economy of emotions and, 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 and moral marketing kind of situation. We want to uh, actually have this perfect victim, you know, and when we are getting a, a victim that is actually uh, putting up a good fight, you know, that, that is sympathetic to some, but maybe it might uh, also kind of um, have an adverse reaction. So I think it's really, um, it's, it's, it's really a complicated issue. And, uh, I think how Ukraine is dealing with it is that they are producing a lot of content and then seeing what will fly and what will probably never take off. Okay, we'll just move on to, th to, to things that work. I, I think and that's a classical PR uh, kind of way of uh, doing things. So in that sense, I guess, I guess it's working. Yeah, I can continue on that line. I mean, they're obviously working in, in these short video clips with quite stereotypical victim hero uh, sort of narrative functions, if we talk narrative theory. Uh, so, uh, understandably, and I think that follows from what the Roman talks about, uh, the storytelling, uh, the, the sort of knowledge of storytelling, what works. We should also uh, acknowledge the circulation of, of these stories, these, these short stories, multimedia stories that are spread out over different platforms when they, not everything flies, <laughs> but it's only the thing that flies that comes to the mass media that are spread, uh, get widespread uh, attention. Uh, and there are millions of video clips that are sort of, they disappear in the, in, in the feed of your mobile phone. <coughs> Uh, which is, a, from a communication perspective, quite interesting phenomenon because this is also a sort of a collective production of these stories uh, because there's no one producer that says, there's no mastermind that says, well, we're going to produce this. It is bottom up, as you say, uh, Katarina, but not everything that comes from the bottom will fly. <laughs> so it's only uh, the things that fits the master. Uh, narratives and those are uh, structured in in this victim uh, hero and sort of good guy bad guys and, so, and all of these. But now we've been speaking about genuine messages and how they are received, right? Uh, created truthfully and and factually. But what about disinformation? So uh, the uh, uh, conscious creation of false uh, information. How much that comes out of Ukraine is disinformation? How much that comes out of the occupied uh, territories? It's, I know it's impossible to say, but do you have any idea, any sort of cases that could help us understand? Uh, I mean, there's been arrests in the last couple of days of uh, Ukrainians who collaborated, of course, in exchange of 
quite large sums of money with the occupiers and one of the things they were doing were they were running local troll factories in the occupied territories. Yeah. Um, how, how many such troll factories could there be? I guess that's impossible. It's impossible, to know, yeah. To know and, uh, and uh, yes, I, I think but, but also the, the nature of, of information when we talk about disinformation or misinformation or, or fake news, etc. It's that what's disinformation uh, uh, from one point of view might not be that for another. And much of the information that we think of as misinformation or disinformation has some sort of kernel of truth in it, but it's twisted in a way that, 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 uh, that uh, affects the, the reception of it. When I, when I did the we did an interview with Yevan um, Tchenko, who's uh, director of Stop Fake. Yeah. He says that well, Russian disinformation is very clever because it's there's always a sort a certain amount of truth. So yeah. you can't say that this is completely false. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and this is the way that they twist information. So so the border between good information and <laughs> disinformation might not always be so easy to draw. No, it's exactly the method that the extreme right is using. Yeah, they're yeah, they're yeah. collecting all the negative news about immigration, yeah. and when you're putting them on one site, the, the general impression is, of course, that immigration is lethal, that it's crushing the nature. It's just that these are the only news uh, that they have put together. So it's, it's a fake image. But as you say, each and, and every single news piece is actually genuine. Uh, but on a whole, so what, are, what were they doing, do you think, these recently arrested uh, uh, troll factories? What exactly could they have been uh, spreading and getting paid from the Russians? Um, I don't know, maybe uh, some, um, like, maybe actually gathering information about troop movements, you know, and then, uh, of course, um, uh, feeding uh, disinformation uh, locally, but also create, like, legitimizing uh, disinformation that comes from, from Moscow, you know, kind of uh, uh, becoming the original source, you know, so that it looks local, you know, and more authentic, perhaps, but it's very hard to guess, like, uh, you said, it's uh, virtually impossible. You know, I would just like to add that I think um, Ukraine and Russia are using completely different models of uh, strategic communication. Because Russia is founded on this uh, Leninist premise of disinformation, of, of propaganda, where disinformation takes the leading role. You know, active measures is mostly disinformation, right? So, and of course they have learned very in a very clever fashion from both Lenin and Goebbels. You know, and I mean Goebbels said that the propaganda must contain 60 or 80 percent truth and 40 to to 20 percent deception. Then it is effective. Ukraine is relying, I guess, on uh, collaborative communication. So it is more kind of oriented towards the Western, perhaps American model of public relations. So uh, you know, Gronik and you know people like that. Uh, so it is uh, more about um, actually having, like, fostering a dialogue, you know, and you actually have to rely on um, a lot of authentic information to have, to build up a relation, because, you know, like, this, the, the Russian neo-Soviet model of propaganda is very, kind of, it's instrumentalist, you know, it's, it's very, it's trying to instrumentalize the audience, it's very manipulating. The, this um, kind of relation-driven model of propaganda is kind of more, um, a circular and dialogic. And then Ukraine is responding to disinformation in a really, really fascinating way. Because, I mean, of course, the obvious uh, answer is fact checking, but it, it, we all know the perils of fact checking. It's very hard to uh, prove some things, you know, it's very hard to actually reach those people who were exposed to disinformation and so on. So, Ukraine, I guess, is trying to be asymmetric in this, and Ukraine is actually. Um, trying to fight disinformation with memes. And memes cannot be fact-checked. I mean, they are not supposed to be fact-checked by definition. So you can stretch, uh, you know, the reality quite a lot in the memes. And one example uh, of, of this um, uh, thing that I would call uh, uh, mimetic warfare from Ukraine was um, the uh, personage of uh, the Ghost of Kyiv. 
Yeah, so was it disinformation? I have seen some people uh, here in the West treating it as an example of disinformation. But so the ghost of Kia was a legendary fighter pilot, yeah. we think. Yeah, right. So in the first days of war, uh, he was the uh, chief inspiration for Ukrainians, for the Ukrainian population. Uh, he was said to um, shoot down first, like, five Russian jets, then 10, then 15, and I think the count stopped at 40, right? And then they announced, okay, this was a, um, you know, like a, a, a catch-all character for all the pilots of, uh, you know, the Basel Kiev uh, an, an Air Brigade, you know, that defended Kiev, the pilots who defended Kiev specifically. But was it disinformation, really? It was rather, I would say it was a myth. It became a myth, right? It's Ukrainian storytelling at its yeah. finest. Then, yeah, I suppose. yeah. I mean, it wasn't complete. You couldn't say that it was completely untrue. You know, it was just a character, right? A character that an impersonation of the pilots, right? So, uh, of course, they twisted the reality, but they did it smartly without um, uh, maybe yes, uh, telling things that were not true. But without lying in this um, kind of uh, a very arrogant um, and aggressive Russian way, you know, so it was like fighting disinformation with myths. I think it's, it's really asymmetric. It takes it to the next level, and I think Russians will have a, a hard time catching up with this. And what about the female sniper Charcoal? Have you heard of her? What is your judgment? Honestly, I haven't heard. Of her. Okay, so okay. Charcoal is. Uh, uh, a beautiful uh, Ukrainian female sniper, lethal and uh, can kill Russians in her sleep, basically. True or not? Well, you have a turbo, so she hasn't become a... But they, are, they seem to be creating their own Marvel uh, universe of different heroes that will all appeal to someone. Obviously, this is a character that, uh, that appealed uh, uh, to me, the typical female journalist writing about feminist uh, issues, uh, and you haven't yet discovered her. But I shall spread her myth over messenger. I guess, I guess, yeah, well, uh, th this is a, 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 such a typical example of uh, a war uh, a storytelling from Eastern Europe and probably globally, but especially in Eastern Europe. I mean, uh, um, they come from, from, from the Winter War, I think, the earliest references, the Finnish uh, female snipers, then the Chechen War, and so on, and they're always killing Russian. Um, and you know, soldiers, and they're always shooting the testicles, you know, and so on. So it's a fantasy in a way, right? Um, it's, it's this um, kind of a, a fantasy character, I guess. But on the other hand, there are a lot of female snipers in the Ukrainian army. So I have, I, I will not disclose any details, but I have actually assisted in um, a, 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 a research interview recently with a female um, a sniper in the Ukrainian army. And trust me, she was not the fantasy character. She was a real, very real woman, down to earth, very practical, very profound in a way. So um, yes, people like that exist. Maybe just not in this character form, right? But then, in, in order to uh, for it to fly, <laughs> we need to for 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 the cost of Kiev to fly, right? Yeah. We need to make it fly, to make it fascinating. And of course, using those stereotypes and tropes is one way to to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, to add to that, I mean, but this myth-building is also a commercial PR technique. Uh, because when, when we interview PR people in Kiev, as I have, I mean, they talk, we need to construct a story, we need to construct a myth about Ukraine or about Kiev or whatever you are trying to brand. Uh, so, so I, I, and I think that this speaks to what I said in the beginning, the, the sort of cooperations, the, the alignments or the, the alliances between between uh, the military, for example, and PR business. And I would say, of course, it's very much commercialized. For example, Roman has Ghost of Kiev socks. Oh, you are saying this now. You have to show them to your <laughs> yes. so, oh, wow. so our Facebook. That was planned. Storytelling. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So Excellent. Planned improvisation. But also, what is important that. It's not some guys in some PR agencies who are just creating this story. It's people who are living with this story. Because, for example, if we talk about and continue to talk about Ghost of Kiev, there were so many rumors in Ukraine who it could be. 
and a lot of people were having certain versions, like they were pretty sure that it is that guy or that guy, and they knew. So, like, people were really believing in these myths. And that's fascinating, that the whole nation believed in these myths. Frustratingly, our discussion is already drawing to close, and we have to talk about an important thing, what Sweden can learn. We have promised this in the description of this panel discussion. What can Sweden learn from this? Uh, so what, we're, what we know of them, uh, Sweden is already a very strong IT nation. Uh, we are highly digitalized in our daily lives. Uh, if we would start receiving uh, some sort of threats from Russia, would we be able to handle this with our uh, incredibly bad physical military skills? <laughs> this is a bit of conscription, but at least we can fight them with means. Uh, yeah, well, I think I actually think Sweden uh, uh, stands a pretty good chance, even though I think Sweden is already getting threats from Russia, especially against the background of uh, joining NATO and so on. So, I mean, we have to take it seriously, uh, definitely. But I think Sweden um, is positioned really well in terms of specific information warfare. I got, like you said, a strong IT community, infrastructure, strong communication infrastructure, mobiles were a key tool in this war in Ukraine. I think they would be uh, if God forbid the, the war came to Sweden. Um, and then, um, of course, um, Sweden has a pretty strong um, a storytelling um, industry, I would say. You know? So, uh, you yeah, know, I think we, we, we have to actually take this seriously, the, the role of storytellers in this. So, um, I mean, uh, Sweden has um, a, a Swedish crime fiction, you know, TV series like, um, you know, The Bridge and so on. So, I mean, in, in terms of this, Sweden is certainly ca capable of creating a gr great narratives. And um, I would say uh, the key thing is, um, I would say if I were, uh, if I had a responsible position somewhere in the Swedish armed forces, I would already work hard right now on uh, developing collaborations with um, uh, people who are telling stories professionally. You know, screenwriters, uh, people who work for um, uh, television, film, uh, writers, um, you know, um, all sorts of um, people who work with that kind of thing. And then, of course, invest in creating networks. I, I think Sweden is really, is pretty strongly networked, right? Uh, but I guess it could be uh, done even in, in, in an even stronger way, you know, uh, in, in terms of creating robust networks that would work bottom up, actually. And um, uh, that 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 would facilitate uh, the um, uh, well advent of such phenomena as NAFO, for example, and other things that are actually um, a symptom of uh, people's self mobilization. Well, what about we are very vulnerable when it comes to resilience because we've been at peace for so long. This means that the general public uh, has a very low like shock threshold. Uh, some of us even get frightened when there are fighter jets. People say, ooh, what is that sound? Uh, but whereas, we, as we've said, um, Ukraine had the Maidan uh, in uh, 2013 and 14, uh, in a sense, a sort of a reversal for this great uh, invasion, this great attack by Russia. We haven't had anything. Uh, of this sort. So, would you say the general public is really prepared? We've recently restarted this uh, government authority for psychological defense, for example. Um, so that's probably needed. <laughs> what, what can we do to strengthen the resilience uh, for information uh, warfare? Well, I think what we are seeing now also in relation to the election now is some of the technologies also used with coal factories, as you say, and. Uh, uh, so I think, I mean, the technology is the same everywhere. I mean, you have social media, you have uh, digital media, mobile media, uh, and uh, you can track people, that give personal messages, like uh, uh, Mugra Altena did uh, now, have sent out personal messages, video clips, etc. Absolutely, but sending out a clip of a killed Swedish soldier, now that's something we haven't seen. No, no, but, but I mean the technology, I mean these messages now are, are sort of uh, not uh, aggressive in that sense. But they, uh, the, the technology for spreading them 
uh, is there. Yeah. So they can very easily turn uh, the content, or the actual content can be revised and turned into to something else. We have and, the digital um, infrastructure in place. We have the digital basically. infrastructure, and, and, uh, and one of the points that we're we'll <coughs> talking about uh, is also the, the point with this information is, is not to, to make an alternative story, but to destabilize storytelling as such, so you don't believe anything, and so, so you doubt all stories. Uh, that's one of the, the things that, that I think we should be aware of in Sweden as well. Mm. I think that you all summarized it so good. I would add that trust is important, and uh, authorities should talk to the society as to an end, as adults and name things with their own names. And then I think it will be easier. I guess you are right that uh, the Swedish public is not prepared for this, but uh, on the other hand you are never prepared for this. Ukraine wasn't prepared for this in 2014, when it only could field 6,000 soldiers, you know, and they didn't know how to fight. Uh, while Russians uh, were, you know, like um, an experienced and hardened uh, warriors from uh, Chechnya, Georgia, Syria, they have been fighting all these 30 years, they have been fighting wars, you know, while the world slept. So we were, and Ukraine was sleeping too, and uh, Ukraine wasn't ready for this at all, but, um, you know, it found its strength, you know, and uh, people were lining up to join the army in 2014, and so they were in 2022. Uh, so um, I guess, um, um, yeah, you, you, you are never ready, but uh, you get ready when it happens, uh, very quickly, you know. I think it's a stress reaction of, uh, of the, uh, I don't know, like, um, organism or, you know, your mental um, personality, I don't know. So, yeah, I think uh, the, the mind and body adapt to work, really. Um, quickly in, in that way. And I think one um, factor that is playing in Sweden's favor is uh, that it is very homogeneous as a nation. It is much more homogeneous than Ukraine. So uh, I think that would uh, uh, be one of the sources of Swedish strength and resilience, I guess. And before we move on to audience questions, of course, how would you build Swedish nation branding? What would be our national slogan? And you cannot say en svensk tiger, a Swedish tiger. This is to, just to give the audience a few more minutes to formulate yeah, yeah, yeah. their questions. I, what do you think? I need more than a few minutes to come up with an answer. <laughs> I mean, if, if we look at Visit Sweden, the, the, the Swedish Institute's <laughs> web pages, you get a rough idea of how Sweden is, is presenting itself to the world. Uh, I mean, uh, at least for, for tourists. Uh, so, I don't know if that, I mean, tourists arrive in Sweden, so I guess it has some impact. <laughs> Maybe we could do our own of these uh, classic uh, loose lips sink ships. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Uh, many of the ones from Second World War are uh, surprisingly efficient even today. They yeah. just work straight out. But it's seven minutes past six. I think we should go to the audience. Yes, we have several. Now the question is, should we walk around with a microphone? And so people on Facebook can hear. What does Alina say? Aha, Alina has left the room. Should I walk around? I think this is the best. Take this mic. Hello, I'm Will. Uh, you're all academics, so I pose an academic question. Uh, when we talk about information warfare, we talk about knowledge and information. But I would argue that Russia's failure in the Ukraine in terms of information warfare is a question of essence. Ukraine is not Russia. They have applied uh, information warfare techniques as if Ukraine 
where? Russia. Which turns me to the <laughs> theoretical question, the question of essence. Uh, Russia is a society of disinformation, which Ukraine clearly is not. What can you teach us about the theory, theory of Russian information warfare? And I'm talking about Russian political technology. Uh, I'm talking about uh, reflexive control, uh, uh, the Moscow School of Methodologies, which is Shedravitsky, uh, and Lefebvre, of course, which was an offspring. Uh, like the games that has been a part of Russian politics, Russian economy, Russian industry for decades. I mean, the Shedrovitsky School was founded back in 1952, even before Stalin died. So my question is, once again, what can you theoretically, in terms of essence of Russian information warfare, teach us in Sweden? Thank you. Uh, shall, shall we answer it? Uh, one yes. more? Yeah. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, thank you for this uh, question, really a question of essence, right? <laughs> um, I guess uh, first it is um, uh, founded on, on the premise of um, you know this one-way top-down communication. So in, in that sense, it's kind of dated, and we're seeing that in a way um, how how that is failing because it is not adapted to the media environment of today. Second, it is, um, it is very cynical, so it has a very cynical view of um, uh, humans, essentially, as uh, being, you know, driven by emotions, egotist interests, you know, and actually very passive and um, very kind of easy to lead uh, in some direction, to mislead. Um, so in that sense, it is very close to the propaganda from, you know, the 20s, the 30s, and so on, in, in, in that sense. What is new is that they are uh, trying to uh, use, like you said, um, a lot of um, um, active measures and they are using a lot of reflexive control now to subvert the conceptual system we have in, in the West, right? So they are uh, weaponizing uh, principles such as critical thinking, you know, the mistrust of, of the powerful, of the authorities, um, uh, the, dial the idea of dialogue, right? They are all the time trying to sell this, like, we need dialogue, we need dialogue, you need to talk to Russia, you need to talk to Putin. And then they will, of course, uh, abuse this dialogue, right? So it's kind of they um, trying to sell um, the idea of communicative action, you know, uh, the, the the way of Habermas, uh, you know, the, the way Habermas defined it. And then, you know, when they enter this dialogue, you know, they would drive through their strategic action, you know, so just uh, they would just use dialogue to. Uh, bring about their uh, egotist interests, right? So these are the key things, and of course the huge role of disinformation that is now deeply niched. So they are trying to sell completely different messages to different groups. They will have a message for the far right, for the far left, for the ordinary citizens, you know, like we'll freeze you in the winter. By the way, yeah, the second stage of information war is coming here in the West, and it will be about whether um, Europeans will shake when they freeze, <laughs> if they freeze, of course. So, yeah, uh, there are a lot of um, question and exclamation marks, <laughs> but I think, yeah, I, I just briefly kind of uh, uh, noted some key, key points here. And of course, we, we do a lecture on this. Uh, no, I think. Um, I I pass on the Russia question because I don't know enough about Russia. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martin de Fier. So you have touched a couple of times on uh, the situation also outside the West. You said that we are successful in winning the, the information war in the West in the invitation. You mentioning what Russia has been doing in, in Latin America and Africa. Um, I myself work with international issues in the trade union, so I'm, I've been a bit active on the Ukraine issue, meeting trade unionists in Europe, and everyone's agreeing 100% on everything. Uh, of course, this is an illegal war, this is, yeah, you know. Um, but when I meet my friends from Latin America, there's a whole different narrative going on there. It's uh, anti-US, it's uh, anti-imperialism, which is weird considering that this is 
really imperialism. Um, and of course, now with anti-colonialism, we heard the, the speech by Putin in this uh, economic summit a couple of days ago. So I was wondering if you could touch upon the issue, how can we be as successful beyond the Western borders as we are in the West? What, what, are we, what do we need to do in addition to what we're doing now to also secure that we change the narrative globally, and not only in the West? I think that, yeah, I think uh, uh, if you want to reach uh, audiences, uh, you have to sort of learn to speak the cultural <laughs> dialect <laughs> in that specific area. So, so, uh, uh, and but the memes, etc., that works in Western Europe that are produced in Ukraine. I mean, they do not necessarily work elsewhere. So you need to produce things that that uh, talk to to uh, people of other cultural backgrounds. And it's, it's much about culture, I would say. Yeah. You want to? Uh, I think this is actually a great example of uh, reflexive control on the Russian side. They are just uh, finding you know, the arguments they can feed successfully. And the narratives that sell well are, for example, the post-colonial critique of the West. Um, the critique of American um, aggressive uh, or assertive uh, foreign policy, external policy, and so on. Right. So, um, and of course, uh, we, but first we need to admit that uh, these are the narratives that are that fly in in those contexts, right? And we need probably to work around that. So, I guess. Um, the, the narrative that Ukrainians are trying to use, there is actually some work that Ukraine is doing in the Arab world, um, not the least. And um, here um, they are trying to um, construct a narrative of uh, basically Russia being Israel and Ukraine being Palestine, being the underdog. So we are the Arabs like in <laughs> Eastern Europe, you know, we are actually the underdog that is fighting this uh, military superpower, you know. Uh, then, uh, but talking about Latin America, I don't think there is sadly uh, much work going on there, uh, but I guess I, if I were to work on this, I would try to again uh, compare uh, Russia to um, the U.S. and say like, uh, well, Russia is like uh, the U.S. in Nicaragua or, or uh, regarding Cuba, you know, so uh, things like that. I think we, we the, there are ways to kind of use the narratives that already work, that are already used uh, by Russia and subvert this from within. I think that would be probably the first thing that would come to my mind. We haven't spoken about right or left, but we should note that the Parts of the left, intellectual left and far left, has bought into that narrative as well, as in Latin America, that uh, uh, it's led secretly by the US and their imperialist uh, ambitions and such uh, propaganda. Uh, do we have another question? Nice to see you. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Здравствуйте, меня зовут Федор. Я обратился за политическим убежищем в Швецию. Yeah, his name is Federer. He is looking for uh, as a political asylum in Sweden. Я из Петербурга, Россия. Yeah, from Petersburg, Russia. И я на собственном опыте убедился в том, что российская кремлевская пропаганда имеет, была очень эффективна на некоторые части, некоторые части мира. According to his experience, uh, he noted that the Russian propaganda is quite effective around the world. Потому что они упирают на самые основные инстинкты, это страх и тщеславие. Because they are trying to touch people in a way of fear. Vanity. Yeah. В условиях войны журналистская этика 
допускает использовать оружие врага? Yeah, so the main question is if journalists is allowed to use the same weapon as enemy user. Former journalist and now media expert, Katrina, you cannot touch the microphone. <laughs> We are talking not only about journalist and media coverage, uh, and journalist media coverage now, but about uh, very decentralized, no. very decentralized effort of various actors, and uh, probably like since it is decentralized, it's impossible to control what, who is doing what. So I can think that probably some people will use this um, weapon of fear and vanity, but should journalists do it? To my opinion, not, because I'm standing on the ground that trust and truth is a better weapon. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a very interesting question, and uh, um, you are right that uh, Russian propaganda is relying on instincts a lot, um, such as uh, fear and uh, vanity, uh, and many others, um, too. But I guess uh, the, the, you have also highlighted uh, a really important issue uh, or aspect of the Russian propaganda model. That in Russia, there are no media. There, there is no journalism. I mean, journalists are propagandists. They are seen as propagandists. That's what Lenin wrote, right? And it's, it was the model uh, in the Soviet Union, and it is the model that Putin revived after Glasnost, right? So, um, uh, and, 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 and that is part of the problem, actually, right? That there is no place for journalism in Russia. There is no place for, for media. There are only, you know, средства массовой пропаганды агитации, yeah? Means of the, the agit prop, the, the, the means of um, uh, mass agitation, agitation and propaganda, as they were called in the Soviet Union. So um, I guess uh, that, that's what, 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 what makes Ukraine different, is that there is a space for um, a journalism, while of course it is not the same as in peaceful times, right? So it is kind of, uh, it has to adapt itself to the military logic. But I guess it's, it's, a, it's a completely different model and we cannot really, we, we can't really speak about journalists being like information warriors in Ukraine. It's not, it's not necessary because there are other people who can do this and while journalists continue doing their work as best they can in these conditions which are not, again, the same as um, free as before them. Right, so there are some limitations. There are some things that journalists just cannot simply help not doing, but um, they shouldn't become propagandists. Yeah. Yes, two more questions. Good evening. Uh, my name is Svetlana Baluk, Grzegorzyn uh, Institute, Kiev. And uh, I have a question uh, for you as an expert. Um, uh, there is a fear, uh, and it seems that this war is um, uh, going to, uh, to go and continue. And um, what would your, be your um, advice, I don't know, maybe for uh, the government, Ukrainian government, um, against the tiredness of, for example, Western countries from this war? Because in one, two, three uh, months, uh, Ukraine, uh, Western, um, uh, not leaders, but Western society, they could be tired about, uh, because of this war, uh, they would be tired about uh, bad news and its normal um, reaction and uh, what should uh, Ukrainian government do in this case in the future? I don't know. I mean, this is um, uh, this is a difficult question. <laughs> I mean, we as academics, we normally don't give advice, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I mean, it, but it's more reliant on uh, firstly the, the news logic of, of Western media, uh, what will uh, be taken up there. It's also reliant on on uh, events happening in other parts of the world. I mean, we see uh, now in uh, in. Uh, 
uh, Pakistan and uh, the uh, sort of flooding, etc., that don't get uh, very much attention because uh, Ukraine takes up a lot of new space. Uh, and you could imagine that there will be other events, unforeseeable right now, that can take over. So, and the, I mean, the, the longer the war goes on, the, 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 the further down on the news agenda is my prediction. But, 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 but so far this war has been quite dramatic, that it happens new things all the time, which, which, which follows the news logic. So, so it's very thankful for, for, for Western media to pick up this. Because, but, but if you go, I mean, the, the eight, war, eight years that was from 2014 until uh, the full invasion, was, I mean, Ukraine wasn't that high up on the news agenda. So if we come to a standstill where nothing much happens, there are sort of artillery fires on both sides, and but it's a standstill. I think that will then Western media will lose interest in this conflict. So let's hope that it gets over with before we reach that point. I'm afraid that we will see some more horrible news when some big Ukrainian cities will be reoccupied, unfortunately. So Ukraine is going to be in the first pages of newspapers, for sure. But I, I'm thinking about uh, Ukrainian presence abroad, and probably it's a task for the Ukrainian community abroad. We can try and think what we can do here Ukraine to be visible in the streets and so forth, and tell us a little bit. Very briefly, yes, uh, the, 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 um, I agree that this is uh, the key challenge and uh, uh, Ukraine has won preliminarily so far, temporarily at this stage, but uh, there must be uh, resilience in this uh, to win the war. And I, you know, first of all, I agree with um, uh, what Katarina just said, that um, I, I would guess um, that Ukraine needs to liberate a major city and um, actually demonstrate the uh, war crimes, the results of the war crimes, uh, because from what we, from from the bits of information that are um, uh, coming from Kherson, for example, like th there are th th there is a hundred of butchers there, I think. So I guess that would be um, a, a one a, a possible way to. Uh, to do that. And then uh, I would say in the longer run, Ukraine has to take public diplomacy seriously because, I mean, I, I know, yeah, but we, us Ukrainians abroad, we can do things as we tried to do in back in 2014-15, but it's not sustainable if it's uh, all activism, it's if it's just enthusiasm, because, you know, people burn out, actually, and people um, get tired, people have some other things to do, right? So it can't be uh, only just this grassroots, you know, Ukraine cannot, you know, ride the back of its diaspora abroad all the time, you know, it has to take responsibility and actually invest money in public diplomacy and promote Ukrainian culture abroad, you know, so we have just um, uh, had a, 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 a meeting earlier and um, uh, today and we talked about the culture as um, and public diplomacy as a weapon in this world because Russia has weaponized it. You know, you might have heard this um, interview of the director of the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg where he recently said, what we are doing is the special operation in the realm of culture, right? So. Uh, canceling Russian culture is a viable option. It is a viable option. We can all live without Tchaikovsky uh, for a while and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, right? Uh, then promoting Ukrainian culture because Ukraine has a very rich culture, right? It is less. It is. It, it is not known in the West to the same extent that Russian culture is known because um, you know the, the connection of Ukraine to the world was kind of wired via Moscow uh, for several, for a couple of hundred years, you know? And it is probably the first time we are talking to the world directly. And we need to seize this opportunity and we need to actually showcase our culture. So uh, Ukrainian music, classical music, popular music, um, Ukrainian film, um, Ukrainian art, Ukrainian translations of Ukrainian literature. So we need to saturate 
uh, Western cultural markets and creative industries with Ukrainian content. So I would say in the longer run, this is the best option and it's well, well worth the uh, um, modest investment it requires. I just have to say, I totally agree. I'm writing on culture as a front in the war and I will publish a, a Ukrainian author in the spring. And uh, I do believe it's very, very important. Just here in Stockholm, you've also seen Ukrainian women use handicraft traditional uh, work, porcelain, uh, this brooch I'm wearing as a means of nation building. And it's hugely effective in uh, getting the word out on your, of your plight to ordinary Swedes. Um, but I would also like to say that I've actually interviewed uh, Alina, if she's still here, uh, the director of Nordic Ukraine for on how do they do this uh, to keep Ukraine in the news? How do you keep people's interests up? And I believe she had a very good answer, which as a journalist I know is true, which is that you have to attach Ukraine to current issues and current affairs constantly. For example, during Stockholm Pride, um, I know you had invited activists from Kiev Pride uh, that I and many other colleagues interviewed about what is it like for H LGBT people uh, right now in Ukraine, for example. Uh, when it's March 8, you attach yourself to the International Women's Day and speak about the rapes, for example, the rights of women, sexual abuse during the war and so on. So you have to look all the time, just as winter comes, you have to bring the topic up of general heating, uh, get the word out to Europeans, how would you live if you couldn't um, if your kid had to sleep in a down jacket and be cold, uh, how would that feel for you? So constantly be uh, a part of what's going on, specific dates, months, years, uh, and current affairs. It's very efficient, and, and um, that's what we journalists live by, <laughs> basically, this calendar. So it's actually 6.30. One more question in the back. Oh, in the front, two more. We give you two if they are short. Okay. Thank you. My name is Anna. I'm from Sedekton University and University of Kiev in Kumas. Uh, my question is about Russian special operations against Ukraine. Actually, we have an um, uh, example since uh, 2003 in the island Tuzla. After that, 2008, about the campaign people are politicians who were affiliated to Russia, for example, like Nestor Shufrich and that uh, forced Ukraine to reject the NATO course, etc., etc. And after the start of the war in 2014, and now we see how Ukraine like, has successfully provided a good work against international campaigns on her territory. But in Europe, we have a Russian special informational operations against Ukraine, for example, with Maria Ovsannikova, this case, that were recognized like, like a, one of attempts of the myths of good Russians. And my question is about how, if we learned how to contract in our country, now with this special informational operation sent to the National Security Bureau of Ukraine, how could we contract against its operation in Europe? Because it's a that much problem. Any, any counter uh, <laughs> special <laughs> operations <laughs> expertise? Yeah, I guess uh, uh, first by what we are doing here, maybe spreading awareness and, and then uh, spreading the word about it uh, by uncovering the mechanisms in which these things work. Uh, then I guess uh, Ukraine uh, has uh, advanced a, a sort of deplatforming, you know, of Russians to a large extent. Like no platform with Ru no common platform with Russians is actually the best way to avoid such things as of Nikola, You know, so just a re re refusal to uh, be at the same stage at the same event with Russians is good enough in the Ukrainian case. Case of the West, I guess, um, yeah, well, uh, there may be some modification of both could work, but that's a short answer, a really short answer. I, I'm not sure it answers it. Yeah. And then the final question. Yes, uh, this is uh, Sergei Kirillov. Uh, thank you for the question. Now, it, now it's me. The Russian story is very much that it is. A victim, a victim of NATO, a victim 
of the Maidan who was very extreme right, as they say, and that the Russians were oppressed. And they, they have the story that they are liberators of the victimized people. So they are just, uh, just defending the uh, oppressed people. And this, of course, is a story of lie. And I think Zelensky says very much that they are fighting for the rest of the world and Europe. And then it must be very important that the response is very much factual because the facts are, of course, against this story. It's totally different. So a lot of factual information is also very important, not countering one, one myth with another myth. That's, uh, uh, so that's one point. And perhaps one way also of making a difference would be to make direct links between people in Ukraine and also the people who are uh, flicking in Sweden with Swedish people so that people get people to people information. Um, I guess I have a short answer to that. I mean, uh, I, I think um, reality is the best fact checking actually and the facing the reality and I guess that's what worked really efficiently here because how do you persuade a flat earther for example that the earth is round I mean you have to take them to space actually and show it right <laughs> so something like uh, this happened I mean and the R Russian narrative of being the victim the underdog it kind of collapsed when Russia invaded Ukraine uh, at, at this scale right so I mean it's you cannot be a victim and uh, tr try to annex an independent sovereign state, right? How do you, it's something that, um, I mean, Hitler would claim, right? That he was the victim of Poland, you know, when he invaded, right? So, and I guess, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a short answer. And any other? No, but I think uh, uh, what you're saying, uh, the last things you said, I mean, we are having a lot of refugees now from Ukraine, so eventually there will be meetings between uh, uh, people getting first-hand information from, from people who actually have uh, experiences from Ukraine. So, so uh, and there's quite a few of refugees now in Sweden, so I think that's a way forward in that respect. Okay, thanks. I think the media has done a good job of telling refugee stories, actually, women, men, children, with all sorts of um, experiences from across Ukraine. Um, actually, what do you think? Should we do one more question yeah. or two? Yeah. How stressed are you? Do you have planes or trains to catch? Yeah. No? Two because they, they, I know they are waving. Let's take all questions. No. <laughs> but could we round up uh, uh, several questions uh, in, uh, and then leave? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Let's, yeah. We're, we're going to round up. We're going to hear your final two questions and keep them brief and then you're going to answer them. Okay. I'm one very brief. brief. So, and, and yeah. Did you, did you understand the question? Can you please just repeat the question part the question of what you said? Is, how do we do to disable the, the Russian propaganda that is winning in important areas of the allied countries? Areas that have influence in the government. There are governments that are falling because of this propaganda that is winning. Okay. Shall we call the yeah, next one. We collect them. Does it work? Yes. Mm -hmm. At least. I'll try with the microphone, otherwise I have to drop it. Uh, yeah, most of uh, our media is owned in the West. We are leaning towards all kinds of social technology, which are uh, companies that's owned here in the West. So, could you please comment on that uh, waiting issue? Because we Western 
or to talk with this a very Western perspective. Due to that reason, big danger. Well, we don't understand anything up there. I think our microphone has been hacked. Because it, it, uh, it, 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 it makes sense. And repeat it a little bit. Uh, yeah, how do we disable uh, Russia pro Russian propaganda where it is winning? Yeah. It's a huge, huge question and it's kind of uh, what we have been talking about partly. I think it's better, it's, it's important to tell, I will repeat, it's important to tell a better story. And then, it is important to also create an, a narrative universe. I think, you know, the, the, the thing that, you, the unique thing that makes uh, the uh, present propaganda different from the Cold War propaganda is, is that it is kind of, it is really transmedia in that it is a, a narrative universe. It, you know, it's like Star Wars or a Marvel universe where you have lots of stories, but they're all interconnected. You know? So in that way, um, for example, Trump or even during Brexit or in many, many other areas, you can connect a lot of different narratives you know, and thus create you know, like a storytelling universe where all these elements, you know, maybe somewhere at, at, at the flat earth, somewhere the anti-vaccination movement, somewhere the uh, anti-Americanism um, movement, uh, if you could call it a movement um, or discourse maybe, uh, somewhere the anti-Ukrainian discourse, you know, and then they, but they all interconnect, you know, <laughs> and they are appealing to different people, you know, but then together when they assemble, when all these tiny groups, these tiny niches, kind of get together, they can kind of like swell to a significant percentage in the society, you know, like maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe 40, maybe 50, depending on what kind of society we're talking about, right? So I think, um, yeah, uh, there was a question here about whether we can use the same weapon, you know? Well, I guess, yeah, um, th there is certainly um, a, a trend in military thinking, you know, that you have to fight um, the, the enemy with the weapons that they have, that they are using, and um, uh, so for for example, the, there has been a, a permanent challenge of how you uh, wage war against the um, guerrilla far, far, far fighters. Yeah, and the answer most often is you have to fight like a guerrilla fighter against them. So maybe in this um, uh, sense, we are talking uh, when we are talking about these deeply um, niche uh, publics, uh, maybe we have to uh, do the same kind of information guerrilla war, you know? Maybe we have to create this kind of interconnected universe of narratives, and maybe we have to maybe have some guerrilla fighters that would spread, you know, these narratives somehow, you know, in this um, almost, you know, like a two-step um, flow model, you know, where, you know, the influencers are actually um, uh, translating the ideas to the public, not the sender, you know, but the influencers. So maybe something like this would be um, 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 a, a part of the solution, at least. Well, uh, in relation to the second question about the, the ownership of Western media, I mean, it's true that they, uh, the Western media are owned by Western companies, uh, just as Chinese media are owned by Chinese companies, and they, that will, of course, have, have consequences for, for their profiles and their contents. Uh, but, I mean, Western media, are, uh, we live in a plural media market anyway, even if that plurality has its limits, of course. But there are still many more voices uh, uh, if we take the sort of mosaic that Western media, if we think about only about Europe, about all the countries, that I mean all national media will be marked by their national perspective. But in the, or taken together, that will make a mosaic that is hopefully more nuanced than uh, in areas in countries where the media have uh, much tighter control by the state. Yeah, just one sentence. If we compare Russian media system, well, it's super concentrated because almost all TV channels are eventually owned by the state or by people who are very close to the state figures. So here we have a lot of various different components, but eventually they all belong to state, more or less. Yeah. 
I think this is it for tonight, actually, because it's already quarter to seven. So I think we should give our panel a round of applause. Thank you so much for coming. And I guess people can read more about your topics and what you're doing on your websites. On your respective websites? Yeah. Yeah? Google okay. Works. <laughs> Google Works as well. And this was broadcast over Facebook, right? So people can watch this once again if they want to listen to your excellent insights once more. Okay? Thank yeah. you everyone for coming. Thank you.